you have to have the intention to do it, but it's the, it's the inner work. That's what it all comes down to. Like we can throw tools at you all day, but it's truly doing the work on yourself that is going to get you there. Mm-hmm. But that's not sexy. So we don't teach that mm-hmm. from the get go. We don't market that. Right. But well, and all these people who have accomplished all this, they had people who believed in them, but they believed in themselves too. Yeah. I mean, it, you can't, it doesn't matter how much I believe in you if you don't believe in yourself. And that's, that's the mindset piece. Welcome to Gratitude Geek. I'm Candace Rodarty. Today I'm joined by author, award-winning professional speaker, and the host of the Grow Like a Mother podcast, Jill Wright. Welcome, Jill. Hey, how are you? I need to learn from you because I understand that you are a time management strategist mm-hmm. and you're a life coach mm-hmm. and your business stemmed from postpartum depression. Yep. So you have a story to share? Yeah. I mean, I feel like we all have such a story to share, right? But um, I will share mine with you today. I was in my previous working life, I was in hospitality and event management, wedding planning, that type of thing in hotels and in catering companies. And it was a lot of nights and weekends. And when I became a mother, it didn't fit with my schedule anymore. So after my second child, I said, okay, all right, this is going to be my time to dive into entrepreneurship. I'm going to open up a little consignment store in my town. I won't have to like, you know, I can do it on my schedule. I won't have to commute and work those nights and weekends. And so I planned for that and everything kind of fell down because this was in um, December of 2019. So I was, I was opening up in spring of 2020 and we know retail didn't do super well (laughs) during the pandemic. Um, I also had my older child at that time who was diagnosed with um, autism which required a lot of extra time um, and learning on my end, which I wasn't expecting. Daycares were closed, of course, because of COVID. So I had everyone home and I was really still in the thick of some, some wicked postpartum depression and anxiety and OCD. That's a thing. Postpartum OCD. Who knew? Yeah. So, um, you know, I don't think there's a lot of research into postpartum depression, which is really unfortunate because I think a lot of women suffer from it. Yeah. And it takes a long time to realize that that's what it is because we have so much else going on in those early days. Right. Um, But it was just a really rough time in general. And that's kind of where my journey started in terms of personal development. I had always enjoyed dabbling in personal development in my youth and had a lot of tools and strategies to deal with my anxiety over the years. Cause that's something that has always been a constant in my life. Um, but that was the time that I really thought if I'm going to make this work, if I'm going to be an entrepreneur, if I'm going to raise these kids up in the way that I want to and show up and, and do all the things I want to do, I've got to figure out a way to make it all work. Right. And so I started learning and sharing with other moms. That's where the podcast kind of came in because a lot of the stuff I was learning was difficult to implement in my life because of, you know, early wake ups and um, different responsibilities I had. And I couldn't quite work in these wonderful tools I was learning. So I tweaked them and I adjusted them and I shared with other moms, like, this is how I'm doing it as a working mom. Um, And it turned into a really lovely ecosystem of offerings that I get to support other moms with full time. I love that. What kind of tools do you have for these, these moms? Well, the thing I found out as I was going through is that each, each mom needs different tools, which is why we get so frustrated because we're trying the tools that we're reading about or we're finding online and some of them work for us and some of them don't. And so when the moms come to me, they're like, listen, I've seen all the videos. I've done all the books. Like it's, it's me. I can't make this work. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We just need to like tailor the tools to you. And so that's, that's what I do. There's a few things that I do with everybody that are sort of tried and true foundational blocks. But from there, I have a quiz that I give the moms called the super mom quiz. And it really breaks down your time management style into one of four different types. And from there, then it's like, okay, here are the tools that are going to work for you with your super mom type. Um, So that's really interesting. But to give you an idea of the things that that I always use for every mom, regardless, um, weekly planning. So I was showing you before we got recording what my weekly plan looks like. It is very colorful. It is very colorful, but it's the best tool that I find 
to keep people focused on a week is a really good amount of time instead of a, a plan for each and every day um, because things flow and move, right? And we get we get a lot more done in a week than we think and a lot less done in a day than we think. So if we focus on the week and we use sort of a spaciousness uh, and a flexible technique, we can get a lot accomplished. Um, and the other thing that I really like to focus on with every single mom is boundary setting. And it doesn't sound like a time management tool, but it really is the the deeper work behind it. So I always say like time management isn't the end goal. Our end goal isn't to be an expert time manager. Our end goal is to have a life that we enjoy living with space to do the things we want and balance it all, right? Mm -hmm. So the time management is the tool to get there. Mm -hmm. So the weekly plan, the boundary setting and the understanding of what, where your priorities and your values are actually lying and a coordinate, like coordinating your yeses to that. And then the third tool that I always teach is self-care. And I teach it in a kind of a, an intuitive way um, where it's not quite as, it doesn't feel like another to do on your list. Like it really does actually fill your cup when you take the time to do it. So those are the three things that I always start with. And then we just customize from there, you know? So what do you mean by another thing on your to-do list? So I find that when I'm trying to encourage moms, especially new moms, to practice self-care, they're like, yeah, but I don't know where to fit it in. Like it, I'm not doing it because it feels like just another thing that I'm supposed to be doing. And I don't have time to do another thing, right? Even if it's like good for me, I don't have time. That's also the reason that a lot of moms won't invest time to learn tools is, is they don't have the time. They're to invest in finding the time, if that makes sense. It's kind of like this, this catch 22, but if we can reframe it for people so that they're able to find the space in their days or in their weeks without making it feel like an extra to do, to make it feel like just a natural part of their rhythms and their routines within their week um, and give it that importance that it's due then it doesn't feel like something extra. Then it feels like you can show up and you've given yourself an hour, for instance. So um, the way that I encourage people to do self-care is to find one hour on their block in a week. It doesn't have to be the same day. It doesn't have to be the same time of day, right? Just whatever your week looks like that week, find one hour. And if you can't find an hour, find 30 minutes, 20 minutes, start small. And you show up to that hour with no expectations of what you're gonna do, just that that hour is for you. And so you can show up and, and use your intuition, ask yourself, do I need rest? Do I need to socialize? Like, what am I craving? Does my body want to move? Does it want to be outside? Do I want to laugh? Like, have I really been disconnected? Should I call a friend right now? And we develop this sort of self-care menu almost because in the moment your brain goes everywhere. You're like, well, I don't know what I want to do. I have too many choices. I'll do nothing or I'll scroll, right? So we come prepared with a list of options of things that really truly fill us up, like not what somebody else said, but things that we've taken the time over a week or two to notice really make us feel great. Um, and we bring that list into our hour or 20 minutes or whatever you can squeeze that week. And you show up and you just, you take what you need of that time. And this approach works really well because a lot of my clients will have tried, let's say like a yoga class for self-care. And they, sh and they are supposed to be there at the same time every Wednesday night or Saturday morning for their yoga class. And they think, well, this is great. I'm getting out into the community. I'm moving my body. I'm getting the mindfulness, whatever, right? But what happens on Wednesday night when dinner's running late and a kid threw up and it's raining outside? You don't want to go. So you either miss it completely and there poof goes your self-care time or you show up and you're not, you're not into it. You're not getting the value that you expected out of it right? And you're wasting money, you're wasting time, you're, all the things, and you feel deflated because of it. You don't end up feeling better and it just took more time. So to sort of combat that, I really like to give the spaciousness and say, okay, find, a, find the time in your week that's going to work. And from there, show up and take what you actually need. Listen to your intuition about what you need in that moment. That's good, good advice. Sometimes you don't have the whole hour, but giving yourself what you can. I always think, do I need a glass of water right now? Yes. I was really lucky when my kid was small. We had a gym. It was a, the city managed the gym. And so it was beautiful. It was a beautiful uh, facility and they had daycare, childcare. 
And so my self-care was the yoga class, but I got to put my kid in the child care for the hour that I was in the yoga class. So she had a good time and I got to take care of myself. I love that. So if you, if you can find a gym that has child care, mm. <laughs> I don't know how often those, I don't know if that happens anymore, but <laughs> you yeah, know. You know what? I've, I've definitely seen those in my area as well. And there are so many ways we can get creative with this. Like your self-care might be a lunch date with your, with your girlfriends, but maybe you've got kids the same age, or maybe, you know, like maybe you can go to a place where the kids can play and you can eat. There's so many different ways that we can work within our, our realistic circumstances that we have to deal with. You know, like if we have the kids at home and we don't have anyone to watch them, that doesn't mean that we can't still get our self-care in or still do something for ourselves. Right. You just nailed something. The other thing, because my kid's 25 now, so, you know, this was 20 years ago. I'm thinking about these things that I did. Uh, I had a girlfriend and we would get together and we would have coffee while our, while our kids played together. And that was also self-care because, you know, you got to talk to another mom. You yeah. Know? And, that, and in person, right, we, we, we were looking at each other. Um, so, and, it, you know, we would go to each other's house so that the kids had things to do. But, you know, just having – a conversation with somebody, sometimes all you need is just to get out your frustrations. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they're about your husband. Yeah. And you need to get those out and you can't talk to him about them. <laughs> you, know? you just need, you just need to say a few choice words about your husband say, I love him, but here's what I want to say today. <laughs> yes. And then move on. Right. Yeah. Um, so I want to circle back to your very colorful calendar. Yeah. My coaching clients have a little chat group. Uh, I have a group coaching program called Robusta and they have a little chat group and yeah, a little Facebook messenger group and their, their hot topic of conversation that I've been sort of st- staying away from and letting them talk amongst yourselves has been how frustrated they are with their day planners, mm. with their paper planners and, and they, they can't find the one that has all the things that they need. So talk to me about your system. Mm. Well, actually I'm putting together a planner, which is going to come out next year, which I'm super excited about because I've like perfected what works um, for most people, it's not going to work for everyone, but for a lot of the clients that I work with, and for me specifically, the system that I use is, is so easy, but also it really keeps you organized, which is, I think the key, right? We don't want to make it more complicated. That's not what we're about. We want to make it easy, but we want to get all the things done in an easeful way. So what I like to do, I really like a planner that has a month view. So you can look at like the, the, all the days of the month together, and also a weekly view. So either the weekly view will look like with time slots for every single day, and you can note in exactly what you're doing, or just blank boxes. My planner is going to have an option to do either because depending on how you manage your time and what your preferences are, one works better than the other. If you're someone who needs a lot of structure and tends to build things in um, with with not much time in between, squeeze everything as much as you can in, then the planner that's got the times like this, where it lists out like from eight to eight or whatever, that's going to work really well for you. Also, if you're a visual person, if you're someone who tends to flow, things move a little bit, like you're not, you know, you want to get it done, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a specific time or your day kind of fluctuates. Having an open space is really handy for you. Right. So, um, what I, What I encourage is taking, I love a paper calendar. So if you do the Google thing, you can still do this, but a paper calendar, when you put pen to paper, it really makes a great connection between your your brain and body, your mind and body. But each week on a Sunday, let's say, that's when I do mine. um, I flip back to my previous week. Take a look. What are the things that are recurring every single week that never change? And I write those in right away sort of the the foundational pieces. Okay. We got swimming every Saturday morning. I got business class Thursdays at three, whatever the case. Then I flip to the month view and I look and I say, okay, what's happening as a one-off this week of the month? Do we have doctor's appointments that I need to put in? Right. Um, is it someone's birthday that I remember I need to remember to go grab a present for? Um, do I have a webinar that I signed up for that I want to make sure I don't miss, right? The one-off things that are usually kept in that month view. We move those over. Then we stop and we look, what what kind of space do we have left? Because if it's a super busy week, the, the point isn't to add more, right? 
The point is to recognize, okay, I've got a busy week. We need to make sure there's periods of rest in there. We need to make sure I've got my self-care hour in there. However, if your week feels manageable after your recurring weekly things and your one-off things, then I encourage the clients to look at their to-do list and pick three things to do that week, sort of three results, the big three. And my advice is always to schedule in, if you can, within what you've got available, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And there's a couple of reasons for that. I like to leave the end of the calendar free because A, something's going to happen where you have to move something. And if there's no space to move it, there's immediate stress, right? Immediate overwhelm. Well, what do I do with this thing? Now, all of a sudden I got a teacher interview at 10 a.m. Monday when I was supposed to work on my emails. When am I going to work on my emails? If you leave Thursday, Friday with a bit of space, then you can move things as life inevitably throws you those curveballs without the stress, right? The other piece of it is if you're having a week where you really don't have high energy, right? Like maybe you've got your period, maybe you got sick, maybe you're dealing with a kid that's sick or needy this week. If you get everything done at the beginning of the week, then you can kind of coast those last two days. You know, you've built in some space for the rest after all the activity. And the other reason I like to leave those last two days open is if you're like super go-getter, you've got lots of energy that week. You get your three things done and you are not done. You can tackle the rest of the to-do list or you can start checking things off and you have space to get more done, right? But if you're in the week where you're low energy, you still feel like you accomplished what you wanted to accomplish because you got those three things done, even if you had to move them. So that's kind of my take on the the planner. I really love to also add in... um, Indicators on how you can check in with yourself, right? I put a little, um, little like a teardrop or water drop on each day and you can fill it in if you've had your, however many waters that you aim for, right? I put um, a circle and you can fill in if you're following the cycles of the moon, if it's a full moon or a new moon and you follow those lunar energies, you can have that right there as a visual, right? I also put in another little teardrop that's for cycle tracking. So if you're someone who knows day 19 of my cycle is a like stay in bed, nobody talk to me kind of day, then as you're doing your planning, you can look and you can say, oh, okay, this is day 19. I better take it easy with my calendar today so I can be, I can set myself up for as much success, right? So there's many different ways that we can get familiar with our our routines, our preferences, our personality, our cycles, that if we use that information, you don't have to use all of it, right? There's a lot of systems we could bring in. But if you have one or two you like, I recommend bringing that into your calendar for at least a month or two and just seeing, did it make a difference? Did I feel a little bit more spacious with my time when I was paying attention to my patterns? So I uh, haven't used a paper planner in years. I was a huge Franklin Planner fan and then I used a planner called The Busy Woman when I was a mom. Uh-huh. Um, I was running a business, a couple businesses, actually, when my kid was little. And um, the paper planner worked great. But I've, in the last, I don't know, 10 years or so, I just now just stick to my Google Calendar because a lot of people book appointments within my calendar system and it just populates into the Google Calendar. But I did find a plugin for Google called Reclaim. It's free. And it adds buffers before and after appointments. Ooh, that's fantastic. And it also adds uh, habits. So if I want to have the daily habit of exercise, it gets added to my calendar in a spot that is open. And so that part of the calendar says exercise. (laughs) Now, do I do the exercise (laughs) when it says to? (laughs) Maybe once a week instead of three times a week. But I'm getting there, right? I'm getting there. It's, It's teaching me the habit. Um, And then I just still use my little steno notebook. I use my steno notebook and my ruler and I, and I make my little grids uh, for my to do's. (laughs) And that's the system that works for me. So the whole point I'm trying to make here is that there is no one size fits all. Use the tools that you can use to make it work for you. Yeah, absolutely. And once you try something, be curious. Is this, does this work? Does this make me feel better? Or is this causing me more stress and overwhelm? And if it is ditch it, because there's always another tool. There's always another way. And once you land on the ones that really work for you, everything clicks into place. Exactly. And and that's the thing. Does this system work for you? When you use this system, are you getting the shit done? Yeah. So when I was 
in my uh when my daughter was like zero to two years old, my husband and I were creating something that had never been done before. We were we were creating a way to sell highly customized furniture on the internet. Mm. And so I had a web designer that I worked with. Her name was Heidi. And Heidi and I would schedule, and she was also a mom with young, very young children. And we would schedule after the kids went to bed until like two o'clock in the morning. And we would just get on America Online. <laughs> and we would work together on the website to develop this new idea of selling custom. I mean, before my husband and I did this, no one did this. So we had to create exactly what to do from scratch. And we would just, two moms, we would get online 10 o'clock to two o'clock in the morning and we would get stuff done. We'd do that like once, a, once or twice a month until, until it was perfect. And um, that worked for us, right? So figuring out what works and are there women that, you know, if you have a business, are there women willing to work within your times? Probably. Yeah. You know, Heidi, Heidi and I made it work, you know. The other, the other thing that's really interesting about this, this modern era is we are able to work and collaborate with people in all different time zones. So I find that same thing with the podcast, right? Like I have interviews with people who are in Australia all the time. And we are on completely different time zones. We're in the UK or in Israel or wherever, right? And so it's really such a powerful thing to have flexibility with how your day flows. I mean, it's much easier for us like work at home, work for ourselves types. Um, if you're in a nine to five, then you are much more restrictive in your time management. Um, but if you have the flexibility, then know when you're sleepy, know when you have energy. That's one of the big keys too, that we dive into when I do one-to-one -one coaching is like, are you most creative in the morning or are you like admin driven in the morning? I know for me, I need to get like all of the emails done first thing, all the to-do lists. And then in the afternoon, once I know everything's done, my brain can sort of shut down a bit and I let the creativity come in and I'm highest creativity when I'm like, in bed trying to sleep. So there's always a notebook beside the bed, you know, and identifying these times for you throughout the day, when you feel most creative, when you feel like social, when you feel like you just want to have some quiet time or some focused admin time and building your day around that can be really powerful too. Whiteboard in the bathroom is also a good idea. Yes. Love that. So I want to also clarify that when my child was small and I was doing these crazy hours, I was napping when she napped. You have to. So I, I was taking care. I wasn't running on empty. I was I was napping when she and my schedule was around hers. And I was a really lucky. She was a late sleeper. Oh. <laughs> so, oh wow. So yeah. So I just, you know, you you make things work. There is always a way. If there's a will, there's a way. Yeah. You know, and it's a lot easier. And it's there I'm not gonna say it's a lot easier. There are a lot more tools now for working home moms. I mean, it, I was an anomaly twenty five years ago. We're so a, lucky. There's a lot more tools now. Yeah. And so many more of us are able to work from home, right? I think we're really shifting the culture of the workplace. It's it's more difficult in some industries than others. Um, but this is exactly like, it, it's so wonderful to be able to have the ability to, to break the commute, to be able to throw a load of laundry in when you're working on your lunch break, to be able, right? However, problem I'm finding with this is that People show up to their wide open day and they don't know what to do with it. And they sort of waste time and they don't know how to prioritize and they don't know how to plan. And so they feel even more overwhelmed. Whereas if in their if they went to the office, perhaps they're scheduled check-in meetings or the client meetings, or like depending on the job, right? But it's much more structured. Plus, you've got the beginning and the end time. A lot of people I know struggle with the beginning of the day getting started and the end of the day shutting it down. Um, so there's there's new challenges that come with this new work environment as well. It, it comes back to the calendar though. I mean, yeah. if you have a calendar, even if you don't have appointments where you talk to people, if you schedule what you need, what needs to be done yeah. and yeah, go ahead and schedule in the laundry. Yes, absolutely. You know, absolutely. Or, or do like I did and do one load, a, one load a day. 
Yeah. Or have a, have a rhythm that you do it, right? Every morning when you're getting your, your coffee brewing, laundry goes in and when you're done your coffee, it goes to the dryer or whatever, whatever mm-hmm. works for you. But if you can work it in and sort of do that habit stacking thing, or if you're trying to do laundry every day, you attach it to a habit you already have. I mean, we all know about this from James Clear by now, but this is a wonderful way to sort of work in. And it doesn't have to be the same time every day if you wake up a little later, but it's the rhythm of the coffee, the laundry. It's not like at 8 a.m. it's coffee. The the um, perfect example of this is because I'm in my 50s, I have this system. After I get out of the shower, I brush my teeth. And it doesn't, I, I just reach for the toothbrush and brush my teeth. So if you're wondering how am I going to habit stack, because you j- just remember that you have the habits that you've already stacked, right? You, when you drive someplace, you probably don't remember how you got there, but you got there because it's a habit to drive to that place, right? Totally. Locking the car when you get out of it is yeah, a habit. Yeah, it's a habit. So you just, you just, I think it's 54 times, you do it 54 times and it becomes a habit. I think 54 is the number. I have heard so many different numbers, but overall, consistency is queen. Yes. At the end yes. of the day. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So where did girl like a mother come from? Where did that phrase come from? I was trying to name the the work that I do and come up with a catchy title, let's say for the podcast. And to be honest, I just kind of was throwing around, well, what am I doing? What am I sharing? What's this about? Who is it for? And it came down to personal growth and moms. That's in the beginning what it was all about. And it still very much is surrounded around that. So grow for growth, mothers for mothers. And I swear a lot. So it's kind of like grow like a mother, you know? So it's funny. It's cheeky. This is, it wrapped up the personality really well. And I find that it's memorable. So I can't even give you an an exact, like, this is how I came up with it. It just was downloaded. And I thought, yep, that's the one. I, um, Firmly believe the statistic that people who swear a lot lot are smarter. Thank you. (laughs) Yes. Is that a thing? You know, it's really hard for me to have a PG-13 show. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I've even Um, like acknowledged this about myself and I swear in front of my kids all the time. And I just realized that like, if I don't give the words power, they're not gonna, and they have not sworn, like they're five and seven, the younger two. They've never sworn in their lives. And I am literally swearing at them all the time. And they just don't pick it up because they don't, the the words don't have power. Because to me, I'm not using them in like an aggressive or, an ex- mm. you know, it's mm-hmm. just part of how I speak. It's funny. Mm-hmm. My husband has a colorful vocabulary uh-huh. and his favorite word starts with F. <laughs> and my daughter was like four years old and she was taking swim classes. And every time she would pop her head out of the water, they were doing the dunking thing. She would she would yell, fa. <laughs> and I was like, what is she saying? And then I realized what she was saying. <laughs> I'm like, we need Oops. to fix that. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> fix that. So yeah, you do need to be careful. <laughs> but you're right. If you don't give the word power, the kids don't pick that up. Yeah. And you know, also explain that there are some words that you can say at home, but you can't say them in school. Exactly. Some, I like to call them grown up words. I don't like to call them bad words. I know we're going down tangent here, but I don't like to call them bad words because then I'm bad when I say them and then it's contradictory, right? But I say they're grown up words. Yeah. yeah that's a yeah. good way of looking at it. That's yeah. really good advice. Let's talk about mindset. My favorite. It's where it all starts. When someone has the mindset of, oh my God, I have too many kids. I have no time. What can they do to get over that? It is one of those things that I always like to caveat in the beginning before I start talking about it. It's not an overnight fix. The example that we can all relate to that I'm sure we've heard before is you don't go to the gym once and expect to have a six pack. (laughs) Same thing with mindset, right? Yeah. You have for your entire life had stories in your mind that are playing in your subconscious telling you what is true for you. You have had experiences that are reaffirming what you believe, because this is what happens. Our reticular activating system looks for things to prove our own thoughts back to us. That's a function of it, right? And, and it goes back to habits. It all comes back to the habits. So we we can't make a, a habit without a mind. We can't make a successful habit stick without a mindset shift in the beginning. And so what I like to tell people is we need to come with an 
with an expectation that it's going to be difficult, that we're coming out of our comfort zone, right? Um, I don't know who said it, but there's no growth in your comfort zone. There's no comfort in your growth zone. We just have to come to a change if we're looking to level up or make a shift in our life in some way, or if we're consciously looking to shift our mindset, we need to acknowledge that it's going to suck for a little bit and you're going to be bad at the change for a little bit. And that's just how it's going to go. It's like when your kids are learning to walk or write with their pencils, like my kids like this instead of this, right? They, they don't get it right the first time. And it's a constant reminder and a constant practice. So what we need to do is we need to a work with, with habits and routines and systems to help keep us like, um, I almost think of these things as uh, bumpers in a bowling alley, right? Keep the systems around so that you can stay with your intention, but we need to work from the subconscious as well, because that's the most powerful part. So I really love to find affirmations that work for people. I love to do hypnosis. That's one of my favorite tools that shifts the biggest for me. I'm not a hip- hypnotherapist, but um, I have one um, that I work with a lot. So finding someone like that who can really you listen to it as you fall asleep, or it's five minutes in the morning, and it's that consistent remessaging. Because the way that our brain learns when we're older and the way that our brain is able to shift is by consistency. We still have that neuroplasticity that allows us to learn new things. Um, the whole point of being alive, in my opinion, is to change and grow and learn. And like, so it's possible. A lot of people are like, this is just how I am. I can't change. Well, those are the people who aren't going to change, who don't really want to change. So first of all, removing that subset, if we're talking about helping people with mindset who do want to change their mindset, we need to, we need to find ways to be consistent, to work with our subconscious and systems in their lives, habits, routines, tools that they can implement in a way with some accountability, whether that be with a coach, a program, um, a self check-in, an accountability partner, right? Um, That's going to make sure that they're staying on track because willpower is great, but willpower does, it only gets you so far. And on those days where you just don't have it in you, when you have no willpower, you're still not making progress and then you lose progress. So if we can circumvent the willpower with systems, routines, and mindset work, like subconscious work, you don't need to rely on your willpower. It's just part of your day. There is a living ex-president, former president, whose home did not have indoor plumbing when he was a child. He's alive today. There are football players who were homeless as children, professional football players who are homeless as children. There are actors, musicians, who started with nothing and are now megastars. It's all mindset. I think it was Stevie Nicks. It was a Stevie Nicks interview that I saw recently where she said, I walked into that place and I, and I looked at everybody like, don't you know who I am? You should know who I am. Don't you know who I am? Because she'd already believed that she was a megastar before she'd even picked up a guitar and played professionally for anybody. She already knew she was a megastar. And it's mindset. Confidence, right? Talk about self-belief and trust and just that sense of worthiness. Yeah. This is the thing about making any kind of change or showing up differently in your life, right? Is that you have to have the intention to do it, but it's the, it's the inner work. That's what it all comes down to. Like we can throw tools at you all day, but it's truly doing the work on yourself that is going to get you there. Mm -hmm. But that's not sexy. So we don't teach that Mm -hmm. from the get go. We don't market that. Right. But well, and all these people who have accomplished all this they had people who believed in them but they believed in themselves too yeah i mean it you can't it doesn't matter how much i believe in you if you don't believe in yourself and that's that's the mindset piece yeah same with someone trying to quit a bad habit right instead of getting new good habits if we talk about quitting a bad habit like drinking or smoking or drinking pop or eating too much or whatever if they don't want to do it no matter how many tools you give them and how many opportunities and how much support and love and encouragement it's not going to happen that's going back to my my reclaim exercise <laughs> it's there it is there and it will happen but you're right it's a mindset am am i making the time to do this one no. shift in mindset that i like to offer people that's really easy but it's a bit jarring is instead of saying, I don't have time for this, like instead of saying, I don't have time to exercise, you shift it in your mind. Every time you notice yourself thinking, I don't have time, you shift it and say, exercise is not important to me. 
and see how that makes you feel. And you can use this for anything. And it's not right or wrong if it makes you feel like if it's true or not. You can say it about, you know, I don't have time to play with the kids. Playing with the kids isn't important to me. Yeah, that feels really gross. Right. But how does it feel when you say having a spotless house isn't important to me? For me, that feels like that's, that's true. That's My not house gross. doesn't need to be spotless. Right. Yeah. And so it's tuning into what's true for you. If you reframe it like this isn't important to me, then you can immediately break the cycle. A really good way um, when I'm coaching people out of a difficult mindset, a story that keeps popping up, like I'm not good enough or no one's buying for me or nobody likes me or whatever is just to imagine like a big stop sign popping up in front of your face when, when the thought comes up, cause you can break it. And if you shift your thought within like five seconds, Mel Robbins talks about the five second rule, but it really, you have, you have an opportunity within the first five seconds of thinking a thought or doing a thing. If you switch it and you can stick with it for five seconds or more, your brain is now conditioned to go a little bit away from its, its pre-programmed response. Yeah. So it's just consistency. And eventually you'll forget about that pre-programmed response and you will have reprogrammed your brain to whatever response you're trying to get. So like stop sign, new thought. Yeah. That I, you're the first person who has ever said that to me. And it is really, my spotless house is not important to me. I mean, that's exercising is not important to me. Um, making more money isn't important to me. I mean, if the, no, anything that you say, you're like, oh shit, that doesn't feel good at all. Right. You know? Yeah. As a coach, the one that bothers me the most is when people say, well, it's not perfect yet. Uh huh. Because if you, if you wait till something's perfect, it's never, you're never going to launch it. It's yeah. It's that fear of showing up and being judged for something, not being as professional or as perfect or as um, curated or as beautiful or whatever. Right. That perfectionist tendency is the killer. Like perfection is the lowest standard that you can really aim for because it's completely unachievable. You'll never, you'll never get it. So giving yourself that expectation is really a surefire way to never get anything done. I mean, done is better than perfect when you're getting started. And the beautiful thing is that as you continue to work on whatever you're working on, it's going to change anyways. It's not actually going to end up the way that you envision it in the beginning, when you're first starting, you're going to get input, you're going to learn, you're going to get feedback, you're going to change, you're going to grow your customers or whoever, if we're talking about business or, or whatnot, but everything is going to change as you grow. So something I like to think about is if you're, if you're doing it right, the destination changes along the journey, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't like, it would be stupid to try to get to the the original destination because that's not going to be where you end up anyway. So just go. Just yeah. start. And honestly, no one's paying attention anyways to what you're doing. Yeah, nobody cares. Nobody cares. <laughs> they only care about themselves. Yes. So I would love to hear about your books. Tell me about your books. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So um, my book is called Happy, Healthy, Wealthy, and Wise. It's a daily companion guide for ordinary people who want extraordinary lives. And it came about because when I was um, in my teens and early 20s, I learned a lot of tools for managing my anxiety and my overwhelm. And I was learning these tools. They were great. But as soon as I had a stress episode, um, I forgot all the tools because literally what happens is your body goes into fight or flight and you lose the ability to access the part of your brain that can, that can access stored information. It's just part of, and I learned this later. So what I started to do was just create a word document on my computer of the different tools that I was learning. And over the 20 year course of doing this, it grew and it grew and it grew. And I was like, I need to share this with people. So I originally thought about doing a page a day calendar because I love those. I put them on my bathroom mirror, write the ones that speak to you. It's an easy, like, I don't have to read a whole book. I get an inspirational message or something to think about in the morning. And I keep that with me. You put your page a day calendar on the bathroom mirror. I put, yeah. So I have it in the bathroom and then any good ones, I just tape. Oh, up. you just tape up on the, okay. I yeah. thought, I thought you had one that attached to the mirror and I'm like, that's That'd a cool. brilliant idea. How come I've never seen one? <laughs> That'd be cool. <laughs> no, nope, I just sort of Jimmy rig tape up. Okay. But I hated the idea of people throwing away, you know, the resource after. So what I did was I grouped all of these pieces of advice into four categories of what I aspire to in my life, to be happy, to be healthy, to be wealthy, to be wise. Um, And I created um, a book that's a page a day book, really. So each page is in and of itself, just 
a one-time read, the intention. A lot of people tell me they include it in their morning gratitude practice or their evening wind down routine. And it sometimes will have um, an affirmation at the bottom or a quote, not from me, from, from somebody inspirational who is much wiser than me that I've collected, right? Or it'll have a journal prompt or something to, if, if you resonate with that message, to be able to take that a little further and sort of just keep it in your pocket. And I really like the the book as a sort of an Oracle tool because you can just flip it and open it anywhere. It's not read from beginning to end because moms are busy. I specifically help moms. The book isn't just for moms, but I was thinking about moms and how they can't sit down and read a book cover to cover. They just don't have the time, the patience, the the energy. Um, Unless it's a children's book. And and even then, (laughs) and even then, yes, but yeah, totally. So just being able to pick it up and flip through, like just asking what, what do I need today? And you open it up on a page that's going to give you something that you need that day. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Jill Wright, this is your moment of gratitude. For whom or what are you most grateful? Mm, I'm grateful for, and it's going to sound silly, but I'm grateful for myself that I show up for myself every day. I'm really, um, I've come a long way in terms of how I value myself and how I show up in the world. And I'm really grateful for the work that I've done to get to this place where I truly believe in myself, my worth, my message. Thanks for tuning in to Gratitude Geek, the podcast for grateful micropreneurs building genuine lasting relationships with clients, colleagues, and community. Our theme music is track 14 by Rev Brock and Soul Lily. To connect with Jill Wright, head over to the show notes at gratitudegeek.com. This is episode 244. I've been your host, Candice Rodardi. Stay groovy, my friends. Stay groovy, my friends. I know we can make it